Good morning. We're so glad to have you with us. Let's stand together on this Blue Lake Sunday as we celebrate together with Open Up the Heavens. Together we're joined also with our people that have been to Blue Lake joining us today as well. We're waiting for this day. We gather in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river. songs from uh, elementary worship arts uh, the last year we were able to go and so they wanted to come back and do that we're going to bring them back for our alpha tour too which is one we've done oh, years and years but let's continue singing with take my life and let it be
Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as you choose. Here I Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my love I pour at your feet. It's treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Take myself and I Good morning. I welcome all of you who are here with us today for live worship. I welcome all of you who are joining us online. It is indeed a joy to be here to worship the Lord, to meet together with God. Um, Jennifer, I hear this, this is an announcement thing. Song or... Chant or but no, they wouldn't. Do, they would never do that to Brother Dave. No, 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 no. Never mind. Never mind. It's, it's later. It's it's good. Something to look forward to. Something to look forward to. Thursday morning, I came in our building, and the. Um, there was a cart with two plastic lugs filled full of bags of groceries, uh, actually small bags, but uh, to be shared with kids at the elementary school who don't really honestly get enough to eat over the weekend. Some of them, I'm afraid, don't get much of anything to eat. Uh, Renee, Kimberly, how many bags were created this week? 55. 55. Thank you for your faithfulness and your giving that we're able to help 55 different students at Chickasaw Elementary right here in zip code 36611 to have some adequate food over the weekend. Uh, 
this was a detail, it was a really glorious detail, it's a wonderful fact, and I, I don't know, just one of those things, we got all this stuff going on and something gets missed. I want to thank all of you who gave to the baby bottle campaign for the baby's first ministry of the United Methodist Children's Home. Uh, we were able to raise $563. I'm not sure if I ever actually said that in a worship service, so I want to state that and say thank you. As you know, uh, we've had a hurricane hit the Gulf Coast here uh, called Hurricane Laura. There's an a announcement about it in the bulletin here about the UMCOR. I got thinking some of you may not know some of our Methodist lingo, and I maybe ought to explain a couple of things. First of all, UMCOR stands for United Methodist Committee on Relief. Clever, isn't it? And they go wherever there is a need in the world, and they deliver goods that are needed at that point in recovery. They're very good at that. If you've ever been through a hurricane, you'll know sometimes uh, I remember uh, going to Grand Bay right after Hurricane Katrina, and there were whole city blocks piled with clothes. People sent them clothes, and they had no use for them, and it was just a mess. And I, I saw more than one of these where there were uh, piles of clothes, just people had sent them, they didn't know what to do with them, so they were piled. Sager, uh, UMCOR knows to, how to get what is needed at that point in this recovery to the people. They're experts at that. And the article it mentions going, it will, we're going, we need to replenish Sager Brown. Sager Brown is a huge, I mean huge, big warehouse in Louisiana where we store things like flood buckets, uh, food, diapers, what you need immediately, it's already there in this huge warehouse and it goes in trucks and ships and planes and we get it there in a hurry. One good thing about the Methodist Church is we are very good at administration. So all the cost of running UMCOR is already paid with our apportionments every year. So anything you give to Hurricane Laura, 100% of your check goes there. There is no administrative slice like with other benevolent organizations that you're familiar with that have really great commercials. Every penny of your gift will go right to the people in need. So I want to encourage you to uh, give to that. And um, please look over the other announcements in our bulletin. And once again, let me remind you uh, that we do want to be inviting people to join us for worship. Remember that book we read uh, together, 31 Seconds to Change Your Life by Mark Rutland? I heard Mark Rutland preach a number of times several years ago, and before he preached one of the times, he prayed this really great sentence. It really stuck with me. Lord, do the miracle here in our midst today that we may experience communication. Because communicating is difficult. I keep talking to people who don't know we're online. And people from this church. I keep talking to people who don't know we're live here in worship. Okay? I'm not saying they're stupid or anything like that. I'm not trying to put anybody to... It, that communication is a challenge. Let me encourage you to invite people to either be here in worship or to join us online. And I've got to tell you, uh, for me, Tuesday, the election day, the most exciting thing that happened to me on on election day was going and chatting with people who are congregated around the polling place and speaking to people and hearing people tell me, man, I'm really enjoying those online worship services. You are? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wow, that's great. So invite people. It's a safe way. Uh, we have a Undy Sunday if you uh, through the month of uh, September. There's a, a receptacle in the back and you may put it in there. And also on September the 18th, we're going to do a spaghetti benefit to help raise money for Lynn Lett and her medical expenses. As we go to the Lord in prayer today, we want to pray for, um, of course, Sharon Brett, Lynn Lett, with the medical challenges they're facing. Bobby Smallwood has been diagnosed with um, a heart condition. Uh, and they're saying that they may be able to do it through a catheterization type process. So I'm excited that they're able to do that. We'll be praying for them. Uh, did they set a date, Terry? I don't know, maybe it's a period. 
Okay, I, when I talked to them on Friday, I don't think they had set a date. Okay, well, we want to pray for them. And let's, it would be really neat. We could start here with Bill and go all the way over the room and end over there with Derry. And we could, uh, and of course, you guys behind me here, by the way, thank you for that music. That was awesome. And let me uh, say this. Invite people to come join us for worship. And if you think the preaching's great, say, because the preaching's great. If you think the music's great, eh, well, the preaching, uh, you can leave that out. Uh, the music's great. Or if you don't really think either one are great, you can say, we've got nice decor in the room. It's a pretty room. Come on. But invite people. It is, uh, I wanted to say that. But we, it would be interesting. We could go around the room, and all of us probably would have one or two challenges we're facing in our lives. And if we're not facing challenges in our life, we've got somebody we love, a family member, that we're really concerned about. And uh, we, we, we would want to pray for them. Maybe they're going through a difficult situation. Maybe you're having health problems. Maybe there's financial problems, job problems, family problems facing you. But we all face challenges, and we need to support one another in prayer. And, of course, we need to pray for our nation, our upcoming elections. We need to pray for our church, that we will stay faithful at the same time, be willing to make changes when we need to. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Lord, we come to you, and we just recognize you as the Lord over everything in the world and the universe. And we bring ourselves before you humbly today in full submission, in full expectant faith, and declare ourselves to you, Lord, that we want to be living sacrifices. Sometimes our minds are fickle, and we change, and we drift, and we get off track. But, Lord, it is our heart, as we've just sang here, we want all of our lives to be consecrated to you. We want to give all of ourselves to you as a gift. So now we lay ourselves before you, the most majestic, holy and mighty God, the one who always is, is and will be. Lord, you are the one who has power over all things, ourselves, death, misery, pain, suffering, sadness, anger, hurt, and sin. Lord, free us from the things that chain us, that shackle us down, that we may be set free and be set free indeed as you promise us in your word. Help us, Lord, to lay hold of all that you have for us. Help us, Lord, to better understand that we belong to you, that our identity is not even in ourselves or our family or our past. Our identity is to be in Christ, in Christ alone. Lord, help us to bond to you completely. Give up our own pretenses and totally depend on you. Help us, Lord, as a church to be faithful. And when we need to transition, I thank you for all the transitions we've been able to boldly make since March, that we will know when and what it is we need to do and that we can keep moving forward and doing great kingdom work for you. We do lift up Sharon Brett. We pray for Lynn Lett as well, and just ask that you bless them and minister to them and meet their needs in the most profound and powerful ways possible. Lord, we lift up Bob, Bobby and Sandy Smallwood with a surprise problem that has come their way, but we thank you there's a diagnosis and a treatment there. Help him be able to come back to his full health, Lord. And we pray for those right now in this room are those who are joining us online with the challenges being faced, whether they be physical, health-wise, financial, personal, marriage, family, or career. Lord, help us to lay aside our pretenses, our hurts, and our anger, and receive from you so we can boldly live in the present now in the resurrection power and the resurrection life you have for each one of us. Lord, help us to depend on you. It is good that we can be together here. And Lord, we also, many of us here I know, because we talk, 
I know you even know better than I do, Lord. And just I know because people tell me. We pray for family members. Some that are doing very difficult living right now. Going through tough times. Others are off track and struggling and just don't really know what's up and what's down. Lord, help these people. We love them deeply. They're at the core of who we are. And we just ask that you bless and work in their lives and work in their situations and do mighty and wonderful things. We pray for our nation during this time of unrest and uncertainty through the sadness and the violence that we see, Lord. Help us to find our way back to you and depend on you and no one person in particular, but to depend on you. And we ask that you will guide us in our elections coming up for, for many offices here in a very short time. Help us pick leaders. Thank you for the gift of leadership you've given us, but help us to pick leaders who will help our country and help everyone do the best they can. That we will live in a time of peace and prosperity, and this will be a time the church will be able to be relevant and powerful and influential all throughout our nation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come on in. Come on in, guys. Jennifer. Okay. Today we have two offering boxes. Well, we actually have a box and a basket. One of the dear saints of our church, someone we love a lot, uh, brought us the cutest basket here. Isn't that nice? That's a good deal. And uh, we wanted to uh, put Blue Lake gifts in there. Uh, there's, we've got envelopes here, so you can designate, put your name on it if, you, if, if you're given cash and you want a giving receipt for that, or you just put a check in there. And simply put it in the envelope here and put it in here. Um, we'll be sharing a little bit more about Blue Lake shortly, so I will save that speech to that point. <laughs> but it is good and exciting what we're about to hear. And then, of course, we have our regular box for our regular gifts. So that the church of Jesus, the work of Jesus Christ will continue on through the church of, called Chickasaw United Methodist Church. Uh, giving we do because God calls us to. Giving we do because it helps us allow God to be the Lord of our lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this privilege of giving you these gifts. We thank you how with with, by being united, more is accomplished than if we were to try to do this isolated of each other. Lord, help us to be united together as a church and as an annual conference as we're thinking about Blue Lake. Lord, we ask that you will bless and multiply these gifts for kingdom work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to invite those Blue Lake singers to come back. This uh, song that we're going to be singing called Jesus Teach Me became a theme song at Blue Lake uh, Worship Arts Elementary and has been done for several years. Come on.
everybody. It's Miss Patty, and I'm so glad to spend a moment or two with you this morning. You know, I really miss seeing everyone this summer from Chickasaw and our other churches that have supported Worship Arts Elementary Camp over the years. I'm particularly thankful, though, for Chickasaw's support of our camp. It's been amazing to see the many numbers of children that have come through, and as well as all the adults that have come through to help. I would be lost without Mr. Tony because he has been our clinician for lo these many years and has been encouraging kids to sing and move and worship and praise God in an amazing way. I also have had the pleasure of working with Ms. Jennifer, Ms. Valencia, and so many other adult volunteers from Chickasaw over the years. Y'all have been exceptional leaders for our kids that come to camp. But the kids from Chickasaw have been amazing. I won't name names because I'll forget somebody and then I'll be in trouble. But I miss all of those beautiful, bright, shiny faces. Some of you have been with us for a number of years, and I'm so happy every time I see your shining face back at camp. I hope that you all have had a wonderful year. I can't wait to see you next year at Worship Arts Elementary or some other camp if you feel the need to move on, but at least you can come by and give me a hug when all this COVID-19 is over with because I really, really miss seeing all those beautiful Chickasaw faces. Love to all of you, and can't wait to see you at Blue Lake next year. My name is Jordan Javel, the Children's Director here at Chickasaw United Methodist Church. My first experience at Blue Lake Camp was when I was in fourth grade, around the year 2001-ish. Um, biggest memory was doing this hilarious skit with my leader actually being the guy who ended up being my youth pastor when I was in high school. And he was the one that took us every year to Blue Lake Camp and always set up the most amazing weeks. Um, I went every year and really, really found my calling with working with the young ones and helping guide them on their way to love Jesus. Um, Blue Lake Camp has impacted my life so much and I just hope that we all get the chance to be able to be impacted by it as well. It's an amazing place. If you have had your life impacted by Blue Lake, stand up right now. That says a lot. That says a lot. Wish you guys on the film could see all the people standing. Y'all be seated. Now, you saw a video there by Patty McCready, and some of you don't know who she is, so I need, we need to give some instruction to that. And I could tell you, and that'd be about probably boring. So, um, Mallory Barnes, would you please come here? Yeah, Mallory Barnes, yeah. You're, you're going to be okay. I've got a microphone, so that So how many years have you gone to a camp at Blue Lake? Five. Five? Six. Five? Wait, wait, now come on now. Is it five or is it six? You went into, did you go in 2012? I don't know. No. Tony says six. Six years. Now, um, I don't embarrass you. If you were much older, this would be an embarrassing question, but I think you're cool with it. How old are you? You're 14, and, but you've been to Blue Lake six years. Yes. So like almost half the years you've been alive, you've gone to Blue Lake. Correct. That's pretty cool, isn't it? It is. Okay. Now, Patty McCready, great lady. Uh, she is from the Montgomery area. What is her job at these camps? Um, she is like our like, leader. She like leads all of us. And... Uh, how does she, she lead you with what? She, she, lead, she writes and organizes and carries out the Bible studies? Yes. Anything else? Um, she loves the whole 
But she runs all the camps. She makes sure you go to bed, you wake up, you have yes. food, and all that. She sings us lullabies every night. Wow, she sings you lullabies yes. every night. Okay, that is cool. That is cool. All right, thank you very much. You may be seated. All right, thank you. I wanted to explain that, uh, who Patty was, because some of you, I know y'all know her, but a lot of y'all don't know her, and I wanted everybody to get an understanding. Um, do I want to encourage you to give to Blue Leg? I know some of you may not be able to give. Let's switch microphones. I know some of you may not be able to give today, obviously, because you're viewing online and you can't. And some of you may be waiting to get paid like next week. I get that. We're at the end of August. So if you like to give, you can give. You can mail it to the church or you can go to the giving tab on the website under giving. Click special and there'll be a little fill in blank. You write Blue Lake and it will go there. Why Blue Lake needs financial help at this time is due to the coronavirus, they've shut down pretty much. Now, we don't expect to live this way forever until we want them to be up and running. They've cut their staff down to basically three people, but if you were to completely lock the doors and shut the camp down, it would be a huge leap to try to get started. So we've got, they've got three people there and we need to fund the in-between stage. So if you would be willing to give a gift, it would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Uh, my connection with Blue Lake goes way, 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 way back. Uh, my grandfather poor, uh, was a contractor in Covington County. Blue Lake is in Covington County. And uh, poured the concrete and set the steel beams of the first building there at Oakwood. They were, the, the church was so excited to finally have a youth camp. They built cabins, and my mother was in one of the first youth groups that went to Blue Lake in the wintertime, and there was not even heat in the cabins, and they froze. But they were so excited to be there, they slept and froze anyway. So I've got old, old connections, and I, I went to Blue Lake when I was 14 years old myself. It's been part of my life. But for me, what's meant the most for Blue Lake is that every year, I really wasn't, I'm sort of on the sideline, but I'm glad I was able to be a part of it. Every year that I've been here at the church, we've had people from our church go to Blue Lake. Every summer, we've had varying size groups, varying ages, different kinds of groups, different kind of camps. But we've been a part of the Blue Lake worship experience, the Blue Lake spiritual growth experience every summer. And they have, we've worked well with them as a church uh, this is one of the places of being united at an annual conference really comes in good is that the here some of our families who cannot afford to send their kids to camp pay what they can to fee. The kids raise money and then the rest of the cost, basically about two thirds, is given through the scholarship funds of the, annual, the whole annual conference. And by us working together, we're able to help kids have experiences there otherwise wouldn't. It's really, really been exciting for me to watch. It's been uh, just mind-blowing the way here we have been able, Chickasaw Methodist Church has worked with Blue Lake by working with the whole annual conference and seen and done and been a part of some really great ministry. Let's pray for Blue Lake right now. Dear Lord, we thank you for this uh, special piece of land they found way back in 1950 and bought over in Covington County, Alabama. That has an amazingly round and clear water lake. And because of that, the water seems to always be blue as it reflects the sky. More than just a lake and pine trees and oak trees and grass and pine cones. Lord, we thank you for the work that has gone on in kids' lives, adult lives, my life, over at Blue Lake. So many rich spiritual memories. And we ask that you will help us as the churches of the Alabama West Florida Conference and we at Chickasaw want to do our fair share, help us do our part to keep Blue Lake going so that when things get back to normal and camps resume, Blue Lake can have a ministry that is stronger than ever in the lives of boys and girls, teenagers and adults. Lord, use our camp, use our annual conference to do the work of Jesus. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Today I'm beginning a sermon series on the book of Ro the chapter of Romans, Romans chapter 8, but it's from John 11. That's crazy, it. <laughs> I don't want to say that sentence all week. Uh, I'm going to share with you, we're going to look at a story, Jesus, Mary, and Martha, which ties us through a story to the message, to the preaching, to the truth of John chapter 11. And I want you to look and see what God is saying to us. And we will continue to journey for the next four Sundays through the incredible promises of God that are found for us in Romans chapter 8. But we're first going to look at the place where we're at by looking at this story. We're going to look at what stops us and what enables us to access these promises and any other promises of God found in the Bible. What would you say is the most crippling word in the entire English language? What would you say is the most liberating the most empowering, the most motivating word in the entire English language. And again, as I said during the prayer time, it'd be fun to start with Bill and go across the room to Derek and let everybody have a guess. And of course, there's already been a slide show with you about it. I believe it is the strongest and weakest word in our language is the word if. I-F. How many of you in seventh grade had to memorize the poem, If? Raise your hand. Wow. I'm glad I didn't bother memorizing it because uh, nobody else here did either. But there were a lot of people at my seventh grade school had to, had, had to learn that word, that poem, If. Look it up. It's on Google if you want to see more about it. Now, If never is one of those words that never stands alone. If if becomes attached to only and becomes if only, it is one of the most crippling phrases in the human language. But if if is attached to belief, if you believe, it becomes one of the most powerful phrases we can say in the English language. There's a movie that I love. Either you love or you hate. It's called Napoleon Dynamite. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands who's actually admits they've seen it. I think the movie's funny because it makes fun of life in high school. And uh, it's been my opinion to our high school people here, all due respect, people take high school life way too seriously. And it makes fun of that. But it's also a movie about really disadvantaged people doing great things, moving forward with their life. And if you want to watch it and you think it's stupid, you can come tell me. But there is this character in there named Uncle Rico who keeps saying through the whole movie, if only I could go back to 1979. And he's sincere because at one point in the movie, I don't want to spoil the movie for you, he actually buys a time machine over the internet and sets it to 1979 and tries to go back and almost gets electrocuted. Yeah, that word if, it's powerful. So let's look at a little background. Let me invite you to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 11. I don't have time to read the whole chapter. I invite you again at your leisure if you want to look at it more closely to do that. Jesus is living in the north country up near the Sea of Galilee. And word comes to him from Jerusalem, which is south of there, about a two days walk. And says that this friend, close, close friend of yours named Lazarus is very sick. And, then, you know, he's one of these people that looks like he's so sick he may actually die. So Jesus tells his disciples, this sickness will not end badly. The glory, God will be glorified in this. And then Jesus just hangs around for two more days. 
just for two more days. And, uh, and then he announces to his disciples that he is going to go to Jerusalem. But Jesus and his disciples know Jerusalem is a dangerous place. Last time he was there, people tried to kill him. I've never been in a place where people tried to kill me. I don't think I would want to go there. And there's even the phrase, uh, the disciple Thomas says, well, then if he's going to go to Jerusalem, we just better go die with him. It's serious business. And then Jesus goes, and there's a conversation, which we're going to unpack today, about Mary and Martha. And then Jesus goes to the tomb, asks him to roll away a stone. He calls out Lazarus by his name and tells him to come out of the grave, and he does. Okay, Tristan... And Dawn, y'all go sit with Michelle. Yes, right now. In that row, let's all slide down. Valencia, Leilani, y'all all slide down so we don't have so much closeness there. Thank you. So Jesus goes out to the grave. Now Martha, the very practical one, says, Hey, Jesus. Let's don't roll away the stone. He's been dead four days. Now, four days is a long time to be dead. Jesus brought two other people back from the dead. The widow of Nain's son and a little girl named Jer Jarius' daughter. Now, have you ever had this experience, or you've probably heard this before, where someone dies and you talk about when they actually did die or didn't die and you wonder? Y'all heard that phrase? You know, they said he died at the hospital, but I think he was dead before the ambulance ever got there. Or vice versa, they say, well, they said he, uh, he, he died at home, but at the hospital he was still moving around and making noise. So, there is this need here, he says. You know, when, so Jesus wanted everybody to know that he had power over death. So he let Lazarus be dead for four days. So there wouldn't be any controversy of whether he was dead or not. Okay? And you say, well, what about the widow of Nain? That kid was in a coffin. Yeah, that kid was in a coffin. But in the ancient world and a lot of part of the world, you are buried in sundown of the day of your death. They don't embalm. And you are put in the, you, the dirt is over you, or your body at least, uh, by sundown of the day of your death, that is, many places in the world. And so Jesus is making a profound point here. Now, it is relevant to notice here, y'all, that Mary, Martha says he's been dead four days, and there is an odor. But a uh, funny thing is, in the King James, it says, surely he stinketh by now. So if you want to drop a funny phrase, use that one sometime. So let's look together. God's word here. Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I, I know that now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called to her sister Mary, who was aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him, even though he had not yet entered the village, but was the place Martha had met him, like right outside town. When the Jews had been there with Mary in the house, comforting her, notice how quickly she got up. They followed her out supposing that she thought she was going to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come along 
with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord. Je Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not the man who opened the eyes of a blind man kept one from dying? Once again, Jesus was greatly moved. He came to the stone, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone. But my Lord, Martha said, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of those that are standing here, that they may believe you've sent me. Then Jesus said with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. So Martha and Jesus meet there on the edge of town, and they're struggling. Now, what we're going to do here is focus not on what Jesus did here at the end, which was really glorious. I tell you, if I would have saw that happen, you would have never got the end of me boring you with telling you that same story over and over again. It was glorious. But we're going to focus on this conversation. Now, to focus on the conversation, let's focus on who's talking, Jesus. And there's Mary and Martha. According to the Gospel of Luke, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were very close friends of Jesus. At times, Mary and Martha actually traveled with Jesus, and they gave money to support the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was uh, groundbreaking in many uh, gender roles back then by having women be a part of his ministry here. So Lazarus, Martha, and Mary were what we would call, preachers would call, committed people. How many times have you heard a preacher say to you, what we need in this church is more committed people. We need more committed people. And you're thinking, why am I committed? Why is he always saying that? Yeah, I feel that too sometimes myself. Uh, um, so we're going to assume we're all committed people here. And when we're committed people and things go well, what do we think? Well, God is blessing me. Because, implied, in the back of our head, we think it. We may not feel comfortable saying, because I'm committed, God is blessing me. But when things go badly, what do we think? Why is God letting this happen? Or worse, is God doing this to me? These were committed people. These were people who had probably seen Jesus do hundreds, if not thousands, of miracles. And they knew if Jesus healed all those unknown sick people, why couldn't he help his friend? You feel their frustration? All he would have had to do is walk and hitch a donkey or something and get there. Come on, Jesus. What the two-day delay. You feel their frustration? We're, the, we're there ourselves, aren't we? So let's look at the conversation that Martha and Jesus has. Martha comes out first. She's kind of got more spunk than Mary, so she hears about Jesus. So she goes out and looks the man in the eye, have a talk with him. And she says, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then Jesus responds. There's a little back and forth between them, but he directly responds to that. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even after dying, everyone who lives in me and believes will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Or he's saying, if only you believe. Right there is all of life in three sentences. That's all of life right there in three sentences. If only my circumstances were different. 
If only I'd have made a better choice than my spouse. If only we wouldn't have got divorced. If only I had better parents. If only I had better children. If only I had a better job. If only I had a better house. If only I had a better mother. If only I would have had a better father. There is all of life. Or if you trust God right now in whatever situation you're in, it will make all the difference in the world. We struggle many times because we focus on our past. That's what Mary does, Martha does here. Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Or we jump ahead to the future. Maybe it will get better. Or maybe I just have to wait till I go to heaven for anything to go right in my life. If only is a deadly, deadly and, and heaven will be great, don't get me wrong. But what I want to ask us to think today is we need to focus on meeting with Jesus in the present. And Martha starts to get this here. She says this important creed, this is a creed, you know, we got the Apostles' Creed. If you turn to the back of the, the, the well, they're not in the sanctuary right now, but they have no, there's the Canadian Creed, the Nicene Creed, which is really long. There's the modern creed. Well, here's a creed. It's a short creed, but this is a creed. A creed is a statement of faith. I believe that you are the Messiah, prophesied one through the Old Testament, the Son of God, the God incarnate who has come into the world. We need to not only affirm our creeds, but turn our creeds into conversations and actions. So are we trapped or is there belief? Now, there is a tendency of preachers, I've observed this, I've listened to lots of sermons, to favor Mary over Martha. And pastors even say things sometimes like, what we need in this church is more Marys and less Marthas. Some of you have heard that, I can tell by the look on your face. But I've also noticed when a preacher wants something done, they usually they go chase down the Marthas. <laughs> God is no respecter of persons, and God needs us all to work together. Different personalities, different backgrounds. We all do this. The fact of the matter here, though, is that Jesus was there. She says, Lord, if only you had been here. Mary says, if only you had been here. What's wrong with that sentence? Jesus was there. Jesus was right there. They're letting time limit God. And fortunately, Jesus shows us he is greater than time. When different circumstances strike, strike us, we have to either decide I am trapped, ruined, and mistreated, or I've got belief and I can make it a little bit better. Let me tell you two quick stories of this in my own life. One is corny. I hope one will be meaningful. Several years ago, a phone call came into the church I was serving at a time. A man had moved away from that community, gone to Las Vegas. Life had not gone well. Unfortunately, he had taken his own life, and he wanted a service there at our church in our town. And they had asked me, would I do it? I said, yes. And they said, would you pick up his ashes from the airport? I said, yes. And somehow, you're not going to believe this. I lost the claim number for his ashes. Okay, Fort Walton Beach is not the biggest airport in the world, but I couldn't see myself going to every day. Hey, you got any ashes, uh, human remains? I'm missing a box. I felt panic. So what I do? I prayed. The person who took the call on the staff was one of the most disorganized, clutterish, uh, hoarderish person I've ever known, up close and personal. And I felt the Lord saying, "You only got one choice, Dave. You better go take it. Go see Linda." I said, "Linda, did you up? Uh, we took that call. 
Did you write numbers down? She said, I did. I said, would you mind looking for them? I almost kissed her when she handed me that piece of paper. Uh, I did take her out to lunch to thank her for doing that, by the way. Bought her a lunch. Got to tell you, and then one quick aside, if you ever are asked to go to the airport to pick up human remains, carry a duffel bag or a shoulder bag because you will get a cardboard box and big, bold letters, human remains handled with care. I have never been so stared at and I have never wanted to get from that desk to my car so fast as toting that box through the airport where it says human remains. I mean, you really get some stares. Another time that happened was in 2013 when my father passed away. My mom and dad were sharing, were in rooms side by side at the nursing home, uh, not the same room, but beside each other. And dad all of a sudden just died right there in the room that after was real shy. I mean, we knew he was sick, but they just died, it was over. There was a lot of commotion as you can imagine when someone passes away and there's some things. And so it was obvious to me that I had to go tell my mother that her husband, my father, had died. Not the most exciting, pleasant thing to have to do. But I walked in there and I sat down. Mom was disabled at this point and could not sit up. So I sat, so I'd be down at eye level with her. I said, Mom, I want you to know that Dad just passed away. Next door, we'll take care of things, we'll take care of you. And she cried. And we held hands, and she cried, and we held hands. And mother had dementia very badly at this point, and so she would keep falling asleep. This went on all night long. And she would wake up, and she would look at me and say, Dave, did Roy die? I'd say, yes, Mom, he did. And I'd hold hands, say a prayer. We would cry. And then we would start it over again in an hour or two. It was one of the most meaningful experiences I ever had with my mother. Not enjoyable, but it was meaningful because we gave ourselves to the faith. So the truth of this passage for all of us is that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And if you have Jesus in your life, you have, Je you have the resurrection and the life of God given to you. And that's why it matters so much that you and I have to personally encounter Christ and invite Christ to come and live in us and work in us. Uh, sometimes I see on Facebook these religion controversies going on <coughs> between those who claim to follow Christ and those who just say we're going to live by his precepts. No, he's to live in us. That is the message of the New Testament, that God lives in us and transforms us. I've seen so many, so many powerful, positive changes occur in people's lives as they come to Christ. Oops, one too many. I get so much on my mind on Sunday morning. I'm going to walk over the house and get a sardine, a can of sardines and hold it up right now. Yeah, I love sardines. If you love sardines, maybe we ought to get together sometime and have a sardine lunch in the fellowship hall. Wouldn't that be really, really cool? So, now I'm getting nose on that one. Wow. But it's, if you've never opened a can of sardines, there's these little bitty fish, and they're just packed in there just so tight, and you have to, like, break, break them, actually, to get them out, and they taste really good. Some of you don't think so. And so, God is saying to us, uh, Jordan, some, I need you to go to the back door and help that family. It's no big deal, but you can help them. Okay, so God is saying to us here, I want you to trust me. I want you to believe in me. God is faithful. And over the next four Sundays, I'm going to be sharing about this truth, about how God tells us he is faithful and will help us. So let me close with this real quick question here. If you find yourself like Mary or Martha, and life seems to really not be working out. What will you do? Will you blame or will you believe? I hope everybody's life is just going extremely well. I hope everybody here, life is just, just, just like, man, I can't. If it gets much better, I'll pass out. You know, it's, it's just great. 
But sooner or later, it's not going to be going that great. When it comes to you, will you make that choice? Will you believe? Or will you blame? Because there's this powerful verse that kind of summarizes all of Romans chapter 8. It says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's the promise of God for us. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your great truth to us. And we thank you we see it lived out in a story where there was a, a very bad crisis. You made all the difference there. Lord, we ask that you will bless and multiply your blessings into our lives. Help us to trust you when we find ourselves struggling as opposed to wanting to blame and accuse others or ourselves or you or life. Help us to trust you and depend on you and see you bring us miracle after miracle. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. May we all depart in the peace of God.